All right. This is where we left off. Well, it, con it contains method. <clears throat> but this is just binary search. We want a contains to check, does a given element exist within this collection? When we did that with any of the linear data structures, like the bag, for example, we just do a linear search. But we got a binary search tree now, meaning we can be a little more clever and we can do binary search. Uh, yeah, if it's not a binary search tree and we want to look through all the elements, it's going to be order n. But because we have a binary search tree, it can be log base 2 of n. Because the furthest that we'd ever have to travel is the height of the tree. And the relationship between the nodes, the number of nodes, and the height is that exponential logarithmic relationship. But this does have a big catch that the tree has to be balanced, which more on that in a moment. Then uh, here's another one, count. Count the number of elements in the, in the tree. Well, how do we do this? You know, we could go, there are a couple of ways we could do it. But it's going to be very similar to contains, except instead of returning true, false, whenever we find the thing, we're going to always just return 1 and return the sum of all of the recursive calls. OK? So if the current node is the thing I'm looking at, return the thing I'm looking for, return 1. If it's not, return 0. But because of the binary search tree property, we know that if we carry on the search, any duplicates must be to the right. So we could do this cleverly. We don't have to go to the left and to the right. We just do the count, do like a binary search. But again, it's not returning the true false. It returns the plus, like the 1, which then you would say like, if, you, if the current node is the thing you're looking for, it's going to be 1 plus how many are in the right subtree, right? That's the idea. And then we talked about this last time. A balanced tree is one such that the left and right subtrees uh, differ in height by at most one. Remember that the height of an empty tree uh, is zero. No, that's not true. The height of an empty tree is what? Negative, Negative one. That's a typo. I got to fix that. So the one tree there on the left, that's a balanced tree because nothing, there's no like, the difference between any of the heights of any of the subtrees is never more than one. But the one on the right, we have an issue because the left subtree's height, just like it's not there. But on the right subtree, well, there's a lot more. Like this is clearly not balanced. And then the extreme case is something like this, where you create a tree that ends up not being a tree at all. And then, well, we don't have a binary search tree anymore. I mean, we do because it'll be like implemented as such. But clearly, this doesn't give us the, the, the value, the benefit that we're looking for when do, building the binary search tree. Right? We want the trees to be relatively balanced. Right? That ain't balanced, that's for sure. Whenever we did the search with a binary search, it's always related to the height of the tree. The worst case scenario is the height of the tree. And in this particular situation, well, the height of the tree is going to be rather long because all of the nodes are always just going to the right in this example. It would be the same if we always went to the left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so da, 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 balance tree. Okay, we just explained this. There are two, there, I think there's a third one. I can't quite remember it, but there are two very common popular ways to go about preserving the uh, binary, having the trees be balanced. The most popular, I'm pretty sure, is AVL trees. I don't remember what AVL stands for. I think it's the initials of people. Uh, and those trees are self-balancing. And they do it with like rotations, which was kind of brought up by you the other day. And the other popular one is red-black trees. I don't think they're as popular as AVL, but I, don't quote me. 
And that's another strategy for balancing these trees as they're being manipulated. If we're ever adding a bunch of things to the tree and the tree gets unbalanced, it'll try to correct itself. And if we're ever removing things and they become unbalanced, same, same deal. Any questions? We're not going to go over AVL trees or red black trees this semester. It's a little complex for what we're doing. We just don't have the time for it. So any questions? All right, so this was rather high level. So we can actually start looking at like, well, what would some of this implementation stuff look like? Well, here's how we can start the class. It's going to be a linked binary search tree. We're going to implement it with binary nodes. So we'll create an inner class uh, that's just the binary node. Each node has its data in a left and right subtree. Uh, and then our constructor in this particular example, well, it's, it's going to be the default constructor whenever we create a new tree. Its root's going to be null because nothing exists yet. And the size of that tree will be zero. Right? Whenever we create a tree, it, it starts empty. Oh, also go to the definition line of the whole class. It's going to, the type T is going to be comparable. If it's a binary search tree, the data has to be orderable in some way, right? So it has to have some defined ordering for it. So it's generic, but there's a restriction on the type, and it implements the binary search tree interface. Are there any questions about what you see here? Like all of the other linked structures, like think of the linked stack or the linked queue or the a linked bag, we don't. All we need is access to the, 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 like with the linked bag, we would only need reference to like the head of the bag, the first thing in the bag. And then with that, we could access anything else, right? Same idea here, except it's not a linear data structure. It's nonlinear. It's a tree. We still only really need reference to the root. And from the root, we can get to anything in the tree. Yeah? So any questions about what we're seeing? Are we happy, sad? What do you think? So we'll create this inner class. What does it look like? Mine, the, the, if you're wondering why are the line number so large, because this is like tacked on at the end of the class that's, that I give you. Uh, so private static class node, data, left, right. It's got two constructors. Uh, get data, set data. It's going to have get right, set right, get left, set left. This is obviously. A mutable class. It's uh, got states because each node we can update its fields. So, you know, we don't love that. It gets harder to test, harder to deal with, but, you know, it's data structures. We're kind of, this is what we get usually. Very stateful. So, all good? Okay, good stuff. All right. I'm not going to go over all of the methods. Uh, I would encourage you to look at the class. You could download it, look at the actual code, go through it, make it make sense for you. That's really good. But we're going to cover some of the big things here. So we're going to have an add. How do we add something to this? Well, we're going to use the, uh, the public helper method, but we're going to have a recursive add. But let's have a look at the public helper one there, right? So the public Boolean add returns true if it was successful, false otherwise. The way this is being implemented, it shouldn't be possible to have this fail unless some exception is thrown. But what does it take? Well, it takes the element we want to add, and we just call the private add that takes the element and some current node. And when you look at the add the way it's being called, we give it the element and we give it the root node it starts off with, right? So we're going to add, and the add method takes the current element and the root node. And then once it's done, apparently we're updating the root field. But let's have a look at, when we look at the private add, you'll see in a moment how this works. After that, you just increment size and then return true. So it's kind of hard to see how this works without looking at the private one, so let's have a look. takes an element and some current node. And if I say if current is equal to null, 
then create a new node with that element and return it. Now, I'm gonna, before I carry on, I want to emphasize, this, is, this might... This is not trivial to understand. There's a bit of a trick here. And I think maybe if I draw it out as we go, it'll help. Now, when I say, I know I, I, I say this a lot, but I want to make sure it's clear. When I say things are like not trivial, that I don't mean it's complicated. What I mean is it's not simple to understand, but you are all definitely able to understand it. So remember with the binary search, if we, we're always going to the left to the right, okay? If we're adding an element, I'm just going to draw some arbitrary tree. There, some simple binary search tree. If I wanted to add the number, let's say, 11, where should it go? It should go here, right? If I'm doing a binary search for the number 11, if it existed, it would need to be to the right of 10. But if it's not there, that means we could conclude it's not there. But with add, well, we could conclude that 11's not there, but that's fine. We, we want to add it there. So let's start again. It takes the element we want to add and the current node. Let's work through this and make sure you're paying attention here. So let's work through the whole thing. We call it on the root. And I want to add the number 11 to this example here. When in doubt, draw it out. What does the code say? Follow the code. Is current null? False. False. Okay. Then I say, okay, if current's data dot compare to the element is greater than zero, what am I doing here? I'm saying current dot set your left. Well, hold on, that's the root here. I'm saying update your left to be the result of the recursive call. This is where it might feel a little weird. But just go with me on this, and I think once we kind of work through the whole example, it'll come together. But pay attention, I want you to ask questions after, because this is, again, non-trivial. So we're updating this one's left. It needs to get updated. But we're calling add again with the element we want to add, but this time we call it with the current node, will be current's left. All right? So now we jump up to the start again. Hey, is, uh, is 4 null? Like, is the node containing 4 null? No. Wait a minute. What am I saying I was adding? What are we adding? I thought we were adding 11. Yeah, we're adding 11. Let's flip it. <laughs> we're at 10. <laughs> right? OK, so no, it's not less than. So we, we're adding 11, right? 11 is greater than 7, it needs to go to the right. Okay, we go to the right there. Is this null? No. All right. Does it go to the left or go to the right? Well, it goes to the right. So we say, okay, current, your right, which is currently null, gets set to, uh, gets set to the result of calling add on element and current's right. Okay? So we go to the right. What is current right now? Null. Good. Oh, current's null. That means this must go here. So what do I do? I create a new node with the element in it. And then what do I return? I return that node. Or I return the reference to that node that I just got created. Now we take a step back out. And we're currently on line 40, it looks like. And remember. I called this. And we are saying current, we're updating your right node, your right child, to be the result of that call. Well, what was the result of the, that call? It was a reference to this node. 
So what does its right get set to? That node. Great, so we finish that, and then we go down to line 42, and what do we return? Well, we return current. What is the current current? This node. So I return this node. And now we're back up to line 40, but on this frame. And what do I set its uh, right to? Well, the node that just got returned. This actually, this node itself, we changed what its right child was, sure, but like we didn't modify, like we just, this node in this example, we set its right to be what it already was. That's fine. The trick was when we returned this node, that's how we like added it to the left. Does this make sense or are you kind of like, what? <laughs> if, if it doesn't make really good sense to you right now, ask questions now. Yes. Let's do it again. <laughs> All right. So what, time, what do we want to add this time? Let's add, let's add a six for fun, right? All right. So we are currently calling it with the root. Current is equal to root. And element is equal to six. Right? So, is current uh, null? No. All right? So, okay, does, should it go to the left or to the right? Well, okay, when we say current.getData compared to that element, the current's element is bigger than the data I want to add, meaning it needs to go to the left. Okay? So we go on and go to the left. So, on line, what is that line? 38, it looks like. We are saying current set your left to the result of calling add on this node, basically. So we are going to update its left to be something. Spoiler, it's not actually going to change. It's going to still be its left child. But it's going to get updated to something. But we are calling add again recursively. This time, I mean, element stays the same. It's still 6. But this time, current is that node. So far, so good? Is this node null? No. Does it go to the left or to the right? Goes to the right. So we then go, we're on line 40 now. The reason it's difficult, from the angle, the line numbers are hard to see, by the way. If you're wondering why I can't count, it's because I can't see. So now we go to the right again, but we're calling add with element. So we go over here, and we're updating this one's right to be something. And so now current is equal to null, and element is still equal to 6. So we're here now. Is current null? Yes. We create a new node with the element in it. And on line, what is that, 36, 35, we return this node, the reference to this node. So now we're here. We're back to here. We're done this. We're back to here. And when we returned from here to here, we are now back to line 35. No, 38. 38, yeah? No. 40. Yes. 40, thank you. Oh, my God. On line 40, where we were saying, okay, this nodes, this current's right was set to the result of calling that, which is a reference to this. Meaning this is now just solidly that node. Then we come back and we return current. Current's this node, a reference to this node. That means we go up to here, and now we're on line 38. 
And line 38 was saying, set this node's left to be the result of calling add on this node. And what was the result? Well, it was this whole node, meaning this gets set to this. The same thing it was set to, but that's what happens. Then we come back here. We return current. Current is the root. If we go back and we look at the result of calling, root is now the result of calling add. Because this returns current at the top when current was root, then we return it, we just return the reference back to the root. You might think like, well, it's kind of silly adding, like setting root to itself. And you're setting the left to itself. But the problem is this needs to work in general. And at every given point, I'm going to go on the assumption that I don't know if this current node even exists at all. It could be null. Imagine this is my tree. There, here's my binary search tree. Roots, no. But I don't know it's null until I call it and start to investigate. So I say, on line uh, 20 there, I say, OK, root is set to add element on root. So I want to add the number 10 on root. Is root null? Oh, it is. Current's null. All right, great. Create a new node. It's got 10 in it. Return a reference to this node. Oh, root is now that node. That's how it even like, gets built. So the magic here is the fact that these functions are returning, or these methods are returning references to nodes. And sure, we are replacing a node with itself when I'm saying, like, set the right to the right that already is there. Yeah, I know. But it may or may not actually be there. We may need to have actually created a new node that gets returned. With this explanation, I want you to be mostly comfortable with it. On the exam, I want you to be entirely comfortable with it. But at this stage, I want you to be mostly comfortable with it. The only way to really wrap your head around this, really, I could keep explaining this to you all I want. The only way you're really going to wrap your head around it is if you work through it on your own. Grab a pencil, a piece of paper, just play around, and you'll see that's, yes, that's how it works. Any other questions about it? If you do, ask now. Now is really a good time to ask, because we're talking about it. We'll give you a second. All right. So there's add. Minimum and maximum. Now, I'm going to do minimum and maximum two different ways. I could do min and max the same way, but I'm going to do it differently for each. I'm going to do min recursively, and then I'm going to do max iteratively for the sake of just showing you the difference. It doesn't matter. It's not important that I did one one way or the other. I'm just showing you the variations. So min. Well, if I ever call min on an empty tree, Throw this exception. Great. Otherwise, call the private recursive one. If the current node has a left of null, it's the minimum. The that means the current node contains the value that is, in fact, the minimum. So return current data. Note that this doesn't return the node. It returns the data in the node. Because remember, just like the bag, it was the data in the bag that mattered. It wasn't the fact that it was in a node that was important for the bag. Same idea here. I don't care if this tree is implemented with nodes or what. I don't care. I want the data that was there. So if current's left is null, then we know we're at the minimum. So return the data. If it's not null, well, call min again on its left. Well, that's all. And now max, we're going to do recursively. Well, 
If it's empty, raise the exception. If the root's right is null, well then the, the root is the maximum. It's kind of an edge case. Otherwise, I say, okay, current equals roots right. Current, well, your right is not equal to null. Current equals current dot get right. This is just your typical iterating over some linked structure. That's what it is. You just had to be mindful of the fact that I start with that check on the roots right. Other than that, it's just, yeah, iterating over a linked structure. You may notice that sometimes it matters if I say like is current null versus is current's next or current's right or current's left, is that null? And you might, if you're trying to be like, well, how do I know which one to use? Well, you use whichever version you need for how you're implementing it. So don't try to be like, I should always check if current is null or I should always check if current's right is null. It depends on what you're doing. Some sometimes it makes sense to do one and not the other. So don't try to generalize that. Can we just start off by setting current to just root, and then while from current dot get right is not null, then do that. But then how would I know what the current's data is? Well, you wouldn't. The while loop wouldn't happen because then it gets the return. The previous. Well, if I say, well, current is not equal to null. You mean the root part? Yeah, well, you're just checking if the root dot get right is null. We could just set current to the root and then just do that while loop. I can set current to the root and say current get right null. Hold on. Now you're putting me on the spot. I have to think on a Wednesday afternoon. Oh, my goodness. So current, so you're just saying set current to root. Do we need that root get right? Are you null? Because you, you, you you'd be checking that in the while loop. The if the loop. issue is, let's think about this later. <laughs> you might be right, maybe. I can't think of it right now. Uh, da -da, da, due to over ordered nature of the binary, yeah, left, right. Okay, hold on. Let me, let me think about this for a second because now I just don't know if. Did I implement it this way for a reason, or could I have implemented it the other way? So, I would still need to check if the current, I would still need to check if the root's right is null. Yeah, so you do set current to root, and then while current dot get right is not equal to null, we, you know, set current to right. But I would have already have checked if this was null, yeah. so it's safe to have that set there for the get right. We just instead of setting current to root dot get we just set it to root initially, and then just do the while loop instead of doing the thing about the <clears throat> But I would already have confirmed that this is not null here. So which part are you saying we can get rid of? Uh, 231 through, we don't, we don't need the outside if state at if else. We can just get rid of that and just set current. So if I have current, if it exists, so let's see what you mean. If this is current, which is also root, yeah. right? And I say, okay, While it has a right current dot get right is null. If current get right is not equal to null, otherwise current dot get data. Yeah, you might be right. This may be simplifiable. I just, yeah, I just find because you know what happens when you get like if like conditionals, you just set it to two conditions. Yeah. All right. Uh, remove min, remove max. Okay. Well, I'm going to do it again. One's going to be iterative, and one's going to be um, uh, recursive. So let's look at the public remove min. Now this one we have some special cases. So 
return element. I start by creating some return element and set it to null. If the tree is empty, we've got the exception. Otherwise, if roots left is equal to null and we want to remove the minimum, this means we need to remove the root. Right? If the root has no left, it's the smallest thing in the tree. So if that happens, then the return element is roots data, and then root is just updated to be roots right. Cool? If I have a situation where who the hell knows what's over here, but nothing over here, and I want to remove this one, all we do is just say, okay, well, this is the root now. Cool? Otherwise, return element is equal to remove min with root and roots left as the parameters, or as the arguments, pardon me. And then when we're done, regardless, decrease size, return the actual element that we want to return. So that's great, but what does the recursive one say? So any questions about the public one? It might not be clear until we see the recursive and kind of see how it all fits together. Well, I'll give you a second to think if you have a question about what you see there. All right. So here's the recursive one. Remove min, and it has two parameters, right? Parent and current. So what's interesting about this is I'll have a reference to the current node and the parent of that node, the way I'm implementing this. How many ways could I implement this? Infinite. Yes. I'm just showing you one way. And I'm, I'm showing you kind of like a variety of different ways one could implement all of these different things. So I'm trying to give you like a good breadth of ways to do this. So we've got parent and current. So if current's left is null, current must be the min. Cool? So what we do? Well, we say, OK, parent, set your left to current's right. This is what we were talking about yesterday. If we have a tree, 10, 5, 7, 9, Six. I want to remove this one. But that one has a right subtree. So, and we can't just get rid of the five. We have to deal with all of this. Well, the trick is, and this works in both cases, the trick is Update the parent, so that in this particular example, in fact, who cares what's up here? Maybe this is 100, who cares? This is parent, this is current. The trick is, the parent's left will be set to the current's right. This is safe to do because everything left of the parent must be less than it. Meaning, it can stay over here. It's fine. And it's not possible for current to have a left subtree if it's the minimum. If it had a left subtree, it's not the minimum. Because the minimum would have to be down that left subtree. So if we are at the minimum, it can't possibly have a left subtree. What do we do with the right subtree? You just promote it up. So this is what the code says. If current's left is null, we found them in. Parent's left is set to current's right, then return current's data, the five. And if we return five, that goes back to the public one, you know, just return the element that's being removed. Otherwise, you just recursively call this on current and current's left, just kind of moving moving down. Now what's neat about this, and I did talk about this yesterday, but I'll say it again. What's neat about this is this works just fine if the minimum is the root, is, is a leaf node. 
Because the same rules apply. Is currents left null? Yeah, okay, five's the minimum. Parent, set your left to currents right. What's currents right? No. So what should parents left be? No, because we're removing the five. So this would be the result. So it's pretty, pretty handy, actually. Pretty nice. So any questions about that remove min? Now an iterative remove max. Let's see what the code says. All right, well, if it's empty, OK. Otherwise, OK, root, get right if it's null. That means root is the element we want to remove. So it was the same as the public remove min one. Otherwise, we have two reference variables, parent and current. Parent is the root. Current is roots right. And we just iterate down. Well, current.getWrite is not null, keep moving down. Update the parent and the current. So just have these two reference variables move all the way down, right? Until current's right is null. As soon as current's right is null, we found the minimum. We get the return element, and then parent set your right to be the current's left. This is just the mirror of what we did in the minimum re remove. Decrease size return element. I'm curious. To, I mean, To me, I think this is a really interesting example because we've got this public remove min. There's no loop in there, but it has a recursive call. And we look at the recursive bit. There we go. We have the remove max, which I did iteratively. But like, even though one's recursive and one's iterative, and yeah, one's removing the minimum, the other one's removing the maximum, to me, it's like obvious that even though one's iterative and one's recursive, it's the same algorithm. It's just I looped with recursion in one, and I looped with a while loop in the other. Otherwise, it was the same. Which one did you like more, the iterative or the recursive one? It doesn't matter. There's no right answer. Now the general remove. This one's, this one's definitely non-trivial. So we've got a public remove. What do we have? Okay. If the element is not contained, return false. If we're trying to remove something that doesn't exist, return false. Otherwise, we're going to do a binary search for the element we want to remove. We do this comparison with compare to. If comparison is zero, we want to remove the root. If comparison is greater than one, we want to remove uh, the left, it looks like, and otherwise remove the right. Or we want to, pardon me, call remove on the right or the left. And then after we're done removing that thing, we want to decrease size and return true. This is the public facing method that makes the recursive call. The reason we, I mean, we have to have that check for like, okay, do we want to remove the root? That's, a, that's kind of like a, a special case. And you'll see in that particular example, we have this method called find replacement. That is the magic method that we're going to use that gives me the replacement node that I need to put there. Okay? That's what that's going to do. So we find the replacement node for the root. Otherwise, call remove on the left subtree or the right subtree accordingly, if the thing I want to remove is to the right or to the left. So far, so good? Questions, thoughts, concerns, comments? All right. Remove. OK. So what do we have here? Well, do the comparison. If comparison is 0, then comparison is zero. Is it ever possible for current to be null? I'm putting you on the spot. This one's tricky to answer, but I'm 
Is it ever possible, with the way this has been implemented so far, is it possible for current to be null? Raise your hand if you, you don't have to answer, but raise your hand if you have an idea in your head, but you just don't want to say it. Okay, who's brave enough to say it? <laughs> it's not possible for current to ever be null in this particular thing. Can someone tell me why it's not possible? Yeah. Because we know the element exists. Exactly. So we follow the parameters that we're down. If the element exists, which we guarantee it exists because we just made sure it's there. So if it exists, we will find it as we go down. If we ever got to current, something weird, or sorry, if current is ever null, something bad has happened. In fact, maybe I should have wrote some code with an exception where like if current's ever null, raise a what the hell happened exception. But that really should never ever happen, so it's fine. But it's not possible for current to ever be null because the element exists. Meaning, if I go left and right, I must find it. So that's why I don't have a check for null here. So I do the comparison. If comparison is 0, I found the thing I want to remove. And what do I do? I say, OK, I found the thing I want to remove. Well, now I have two ifs. If parent's data compared to if the parent data compared to current.getData is greater than 0, I need to find a replacement node for the, left sub, for the parent's left subtree. Otherwise, do it for the right subtree. I, I can't tell if you're like, yeah, it makes perfect sense, or you're like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Diagrams might help. I'm just, I'm, I'm cautious of time. Okay, let's have a look at how this is called. So we call it with root, roots left, root, roots, okay. So let's say I've got 10, 15, and 11. Actually, I want to check to make sure I don't have a figure here first, because I don't want to. All right. So if comparison zero, I found the thing I want to remove. Oh, this is just because I actually don't know if the current node is the left or the right subchild. That's what this is doing. If I say I want to remove 15, for example, OK, this is my binary search tree, mm, 7, 4. Fill it out a little more. All this current like data frame knows is what the current is, what the parent is, current and the thing I want to remove. I want to remove this node, right? So I want to get rid of it, and I need to find a replacement node for this. But here's like the funny thing is we're going to have to update what the parent's right child is referencing. But current has no knowledge of if it's the left or the right child. So that's what this check is doing. There's that. Well, we're getting there. Which we're. I don't think we're going to get through this today. <laughs> Basically, this check is to say, okay, who needs to be replaced? The left or the right sub the, the the left or the right subtree. The left or right child. Which one needs to be replaced? Well, we do the check with the parent there, because. Current doesn't actually know if it was the left or right child. Parent would be the one to know, well, you were my right because you were bigger than me. Right? Yeah? yeah? yeah. 
So this is, I found the one I want to remove, update, find the replacement node for current, and set and update the parents left or right accordingly. Left or right depending on who's, which child it was. But you'll notice, again, this depends on that magic uh, find replacement node. We'll get to there. Return current data, yeah, that's the thing we're removing. Okay, else if comparison's greater, you call remove on the left, otherwise call it on the right. So these are the like, okay, go, go left, go right, but if you want to remove it, we got to remove it, we got to know which child is actually getting updated for the parent. This all depends on knowing, okay, well, what's the replacement node, though? If I'm eliminating this, what goes in its place? Maybe it's null, maybe it's another node, I don't know. Maybe that node has a bunch of children, maybe something in there needed to change, I don't know. But I need that replacement node, and that's where find replacement node comes in. So what does find replacement node look like? This simple little thing. It's really not that bad, and I'm going to try to get through it, but I don't think we're going to get through it today, but let's see. So replacement node starts at null. If to remove, this is the node I want to get rid of, that I need a replacement for. If to remove doesn't have a left, and it doesn't have a right, well then it doesn't, the replacement node, it, it, it was a leaf node. It gets replaced with nothing. Easy peasy, return null. So the parents, so this would be the case like this. The parents right would get set to be the replacement node, which is null. Because we're getting rid of 15, nothing gets put in its place. Else if, if get left is not null, and right is null, meaning it looks like this. If this is the case, well, the replacement node is just uh, the left subtree. The whole left subtree just gets promoted. It's fine. Is that what it says? Replacement node, yeah, is to remove, get left. Perfect. If left is null but right isn't, you just promote it up. It's, it's, it's fine. So the cases we've covered is it might get replaced with nothing, that's easy. If it only has one child, regardless of it the left or the right, just promote it up, it's fine. But what happens if we have something like this? This is where, okay, what do we do? And this is where we're gonna do that thing where we find the smallest element in the, whole, in the right subtree to replace it. So, we'll see. So far, so good, though? I'm really having a hard time gauging you today. So what do we do? Well, we've got this parent and current, right? So the same idea with when we had the iterative uh, remove max, I think, parent and current. Current's get left is not null. Parent current is to removes right. Find the in order successor, perfect, yeah. So find, if we are removing this node, we need the right child's smallest element. Okay? The right subtree's smallest element, right? In this case, it would be the 14. But remember, who knows what's going on over here? Why is there a 14 here? Why did no one fix that? <laughs> there. <laughs> it's a 19. Because maybe there's a 16 here, right? I would need the 16 to go here. Do you remember last time we were saying whenever you want to replace the node, and it's kind of this icky situation, always replace it with the right child's, the right Subtree's smallest element. Because if it's the smallest element, I know it's bigger than everything over here because it was to the right of this thing, and everything over here was less than this thing. 
And I know it's smaller than everything else in the right subtree because it's the smallest thing in the right subtree. So we're promoting it there. In the example we saw, we did the opposite, where we took the left subtree's biggest thing. Whatever, it's fine. It makes more sense to go to the right here because we always put duplicates to the right, and so we could replace it with a duplicate. That makes sense to me. All right, we'll end here and pick up on Friday because I don't want to. I don't want to rush through this. <laughs>